Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode uh, of uh, DMTV Christmas Special. Uh, I have a great uh, honor, and I'm very happy that uh, tonight uh, we have with us uh, uh, my uh, dear uh, colleague and friend, uh, Olga Dimitrievic. Uh, Olga Dimitrievic uh, is a uh, uh, she wants to call herself a Yugoslav uh, playwright, uh, theater director, and also performer. Uh, but as I said, she is also uh, my dear uh, close friend. Uh, and um, hello, Olga. I would like to uh, start with friendship, if that's okay with you. Uh, hello, Maya. It's always uh, okay to start uh, with a friendship. Yes, because I was thinking uh, a lot uh, by, you know, raising uh, big, serious questions at the beginning of our talk. But then I realized that uh, maybe friendship is a big, uh, serious topic that uh, we do not uh, talk about too much in uh, today's world. We talk about the crisis of economy, the crisis of ecology, the crisis of the capitalist system, uh, lots of uh, crisis, major crisis. But we do not talk about a crisis that I think is uh, very important, that that is a crisis of uh, care and, and real, uh, real friendship and, in a way, a crisis of comradeship in the real sense of the way. Uh, we relate uh, to each other in a, very often in a, a biological sense. Uh, we uh, care about our biological relatives. Uh, we care about our immediate family. Uh, but I think that uh, this world has um, uh, been, in a way, alienated of uh, this real uh, com comradeship and solidarity. And this is the basis of your work, in a way. So I wanted to start with that. Uh, what do you think uh, is happening with real friendship today? And uh, can we do something to uh, maybe uh, make these bonds closer? Um... Actually, it's really great that we're starting with this because somehow the, the, the question of real friendship, like whatever real friendship is, but for me, it is the question of love. And um, the question of love for me is also the question of how we will imagine our future politics and uh, how do we want to create uh, the, the uh, future world for ourselves and our future relationships. And... Um, Yes, somehow the, the, this kind of um, love and care for each other and the topic of, well, mainly female friendship uh, stands as uh, one of the most important motives in almost whatever I work, whether it is about, you know, methodology of the work or if it is about, uh, 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 or if it is about how uh, the topic. And... Um, it's also somehow funny now when you say this, like I had to remember that, you know, also coming from the queer community and all, uh, learning about the history, um, it was always somehow necessary to, to create, uh, for queer people, it was always necessary to create these alternative bonds and these alternative love structures and these alternative friendship structures that will somehow actually supplement uh, the nuclear family that is not accepting, uh, 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 that is not accepting, and um, uh, this kind of uh, this is already a huge history of trying constantly to create and recreate uh, different kinds of connections from those that that we um, that we learned uh, 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 in our childhood and uh, with uh, with uh, the birth and also within the confinement of this whole you know how the uh, the society how the nuclear family is the, the old story integral part of of capitalist society Yes, and uh, also when you mentioned that these friendships are always female friendships, and I also think that this is uh, the basis of uh, all your writing, that you always write about this uh, rebellious, revolutionary female subject, uh, and you also uh, very closely tie this to uh, civil disobedience. Uh, in a way, we have this uh, 
uh, uh, female uh, uh, subject in all like all your plays. Uh, like in your plays, um, now I will say some of the titles, uh, like Workers uh, Die Singing, where this uh, main female subject is fighting the work for the workers' rights. In your folk play, uh, the subject is uh, fighting the traditional family values. And uh, your play, My Dear, uh, this main female character is uh, fighting uh, the system of inheritance uh, in your play uh, of the end of the world uh, she is fighting for nature and uh, in one of your last plays i often dream of a revolution she is fighting for a feminist revolution uh, so how important uh, is uh, this this for you and uh, why uh, uh, in a way do you um, uh, how do you think that a brave woman can save the world and how how uh, important are these women rights in your work uh, well at the first place i deeply believe that rebellious women will save the world like if there is anyone who will save the world it will be rebellious women and uh, the, it comes from you know a, a, a simple fact that um maybe we have there is very constant feeling that we have had enough of, you know, of oppression, of many layers of oppression, of patriarchal oppression, of capitalist oppression, of, of, of many, many, many layers of, of uh, how we find ourselves oppressed in, uh, um, in the contemporary society. Um, and then at the same time, uh, it's also, you know, the, this a factual part, this, this uh, 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 importance of effect in in uh, our lives and in uh, women's lives that really creates um on the one hand uh, it creates uh, the the reaction to the to the injustice and on the other hand it also is something that cre creates these big love bonds that are also friendship bonds uh, uh, um and it, that teaches something about you know collective solidarity that teaches something about you know not only being focused on on oneself on on uh individual um uh, interests and uh, individual agenda but also how to somehow share it how to find a common language between sometimes very different um uh, different people from different class positions or dif like different positions in the society and how to uh, like the story for me at least the story about you know re different rebellious women coming together um is one you know big story of of uh, civilization if i can say so uh the, the, like the big story of of humanity uh that actually tells us about possibility to be together to live together and to fight together Yes, and you often uh, talk about uh, uh, the partisan uh, movement and the female partisan movement uh, and the female partisans and heroines that uh, people don't know much about. Can you tell us something about that? Well, yeah, it's very often in in the focus of of um, some of the pieces, one way or the other. For example, in the piece, my dear, it's very much in the. Uh, 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 it's very much the basis of the whole plot that the, the story starts with the funeral of one of women who was fighting in the Second World War in the partisan movement, and was also very prominent in um, uh, uh, um, in uh, the socialist life afterwards. And now she is dead because biologically the, uh, um, that generation is dying, uh, and men, most of them have died until now. Uh, but their heritage and their legacy is something that, for example, in contemporary Serbia, actually on the whole space of, of Yugoslavia is um, um, thrown back uh, in, the, in the shadows. It's uh, under very serious uh, historical revisionism. Um, it's very undermined. Uh, uh, but we are talking about generation of women who, who were fighting in the Second World War massively on really massive scale who were self-organized uh, in the sense that they established the parallel structures within the war conditions that helped them and enabled them to, you know, take care of each other, try to take care of the children, try to work on literacy, uh, which was also a huge problem. Where the, the, there was insanely small percentage of women who could read and write back in the, 40, back in the 40s uh, here and uh, who, among all things, in the whole this um, 
through the through this uh, war effort and through this war struggle, they managed to fight for themselves uh, better life conditions and uh, bigger rights for them after the war. And this is the kind of emancipatory leap that was um, impossible to imagine until that generation and until the whole practically socialist revolution that was also brought out through through the through the through the war in um, through the Second World War in Yugoslavia. Um, and it is really the big question of whether we will have again that kind of emancipatory leap for women or you know also other groups of people because um, if we know that I don't know maybe women could not could not vote before but very few women went to the schools very few women uh, had uh, 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 like the laws uh, about everything more or less um, uh, for a uh, women were not in favor of the society and the, its laws uh, back uh, before uh, practically uh, second world war and um, their very selfish and big struggle um, was um, something that brought us okay whatever right to vote is only one of the things but actually it brought us uh, the whole system of kindergartens brought us the whole system of, uh, you know, public uh, kitchens that could be, you know, somehow used to remove part of, of typical women's burdens uh, from them. And most of all, if it was not for them, probably both of us would not be sitting here talking together and uh, doing what we are doing now because, you know, our lives would probably be predestined to, you know, work in the field, uh, never learn to read and write. And, uh, you know, it would be very, very, it would be much more difficult for us. Yes, I and know, it's, explained it well. Yes, you did. And you said a very important point, And that is that this emancipatory thing that came from, from the socialist uh, revolution is something that people do not talk so much about because we always uh, perceive this uh, as a, a Western thing. Like, you know, the freedom came with, with Western thought. Uh, the, the socialist movement is very much, uh, when we talk about it in popular culture, we imagine, you know, gulags and unfreedom. And it's very important that you, you sa said this because I think that uh, these uh, big uh, emancipatory questions uh, concerning women's rights uh, are also uh, important uh, in your work. And uh, also, as you said, uh, um, like most of your characters, mostly all of them uh, or some of them are uh, lesbians. Uh, but the way that you uh, treat uh, the LGBT issues in, in your work uh, is different that, than, uh, um, than I saw in, in most uh, literature that deals with, with these kinds of issues. Uh, and uh, I would mention it because of uh, things you just said. Uh, and that is uh, the, um, that uh, in a way, uh, I think that the big problem is uh, when treating LGBT issues is not treating the class issues with it and not tr treating uh, this, what you said, the vulnerables, uh, the ones that are uh, have uh, low incomes, uh, the workers, uh, like all the categories of people that uh, uh, have uh, have problems in a way being different and not being uh, a part of the system. Uh, so uh, can you tell me uh, in which way generally do you deal with these issues in your work uh, and uh, how important uh, and how closely related are uh, gen uh, gender and uh, class issues uh, in your work? Yeah, um, okay, d d several things, yeah. Um, first, just to, to comment slightly on what you said, like with this idea that freedom comes with the, with the West, um, yeah, like it all, always depends how you define freedom. And I believe that we will talk about it more later. In the case of socialist women and in the case of women in the in our space, the freedom and emancipation came with the socialist revolution. Of course, we have to say that also socialists were patriarchal as well. So like very soon that level of rights didn't go much more up, but you know, some kind of retraditionalism the retraditionalization happened, but still that what happened after 91, especially here, was the big, big step back in the sense of also, you know, the, uh, like ideological values of how we see uh, where women should be, 
um, uh, in the society, but at the same time, ideological values in the sense where everybody should be in the society. Like it, it was like a serious, uh, how to say, uh, counter emancipatory backlash, if I can say so. Um, when it comes to when it comes to you know representation of of um, LGBT characters or when it comes to represent the, the, this topic of representation, uh, I have always tried to um, move beyond the simple identity politics somehow and to especially because you know I was also studying a lot about um, the history of queer film and I was studying a lot about um like i don't know just finishing i guess gender studies brings you and if you're interested in film somehow brings you in in that direction and it was very um uh, like some topics uh, it was very easy to deduct what are the problems with this representation it was very easy to deduct what was bothering me uh, when it comes to um, uh, how how characters and plots um, are uh, being created, and um, it, it, at the same time, like always, one of the big uh, 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 most important rules is um, that e you should not have the plot or the character which is there only because it's LGBT. Or if you have it, then let's make bigger. Uh, uh, let's not only have it as you know metaphor for social commentary but give it something else make it more nuanced make it uh, uh, um, or make your own um, coalition between the character and social commentary that will not that will uh, jump out of of um, the shablon jump out of the pattern and um, yeah which brings us again to the third uh, issue that you mentioned and that's the question of gender and class and uh, at least for me, you know, gender and class were always, always uh, intertwined, intertwined and always that kind of intersection, also as intersection with other forms of oppression um, was also something that, you know, at least in the feminist theory was much more my cup of tea than, for example, pure liberal feminism or, or uh, something like that. And uh, like speaking about intersection of gender and class, like, in in my plays uh, or in the stuff that I work, it, I was always interested to see how uh, or to explore how it is possible to connect uh, different classes along the lines of gender and what are the limits in uh, in um, uh, in that aspect, and uh, also the the other way around how it is. Um, uh, uh, um, or not really the other way around, but uh, somehow to explore also the ambiguities uh, that that um, arise from from uh, uh, these connections, how to understand also different classes, how to understand the classes. Um, is there a potential in the classes that are not my class, uh, 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 that are higher upper classes uh, than than the class that I belong to, and so on. Yeah, yeah that, that's also interesting uh, because uh, at the beginning of the talk you also mentioned love, like a very powerful uh, category for and a very powerful place for uh, maybe resistance and revolution. Uh, so you are also a director uh, and uh, you directed, um, uh, you dramatized and uh, worked on uh, the book Red Love by Alexander Kolontai the prominent uh, Russian revolutionary. Uh, in this book, she uh, deals with the question of sexual politics, uh, free love, uh, also motherhood and comradely love. Uh, so um, today I think that uh, um, love uh, is also a, a category that uh, changed and we can also relate it uh, to class in a way. Uh, so uh, if we say that love is today also a place for resistance and uh, revolution, possible revolution, what would uh, red love be today for you and what was it then? And why did you choose this book to talk about this topic? Actually, I chose it because it's not so much different than today, somehow, at least from, from um, um, some kind of perspective of, I don't know, progressive movements. And uh, what we very often face uh, is, you know, actually this big power, this balance between men and women, which are still within the, uh, in spite of, you know, that we are very much aware that it shouldn't be like that. But it's something similar with 
are socialist comrades from 100 years ago. That, that's why Alexandra Kolontai's novel was interested, interesting. And uh, it was really nice how, the, the, in, in that novel, it's really nice how the, she has this incredibly kitschy, simple language. And I love that. I love this kind of, you know, kitschy descriptions full of adjectives and uh, I don't know what. Um, but at the same time, the plot is about love between two revolutionaries and revolution happens and they're still in love. But then five years later, he's, you know, typical uh, general manager of the company who fucks his secretary and she's uh, just not acclaimed and she's suffering and she's just regular. She acts like a regular bourgeois woman. And that's where Alexandra Kolontai takes that kind of a, of a plot to practically explain how is that still possible and how is that possible for every woman of this world to fall into that kind of trap and also for every man of this world to fall into that kind of trap in order to make the big circle um, to come to the to the point that um, yeah, the, the question of children should not only be the question of one dysfunctional uh, heterosexual family, but that the whole society should in a way take care. But also she comes to the point that actually it is uh, the story about um, female comradeship. And uh, she finds uh, uh, um, at the end of the piece, or that was actually what was most interesting, interesting for me, um, and the most important is that at the end of the piece, she's actually speaking with her friend. And then she asks, uh, the, uh, so what are you going to do with the child now? And then she says, we'll bring it up together. Like, we really don't need uh, anything else. We need the organization. We need to be with, with each other. We need to be solidary and so on and so on. Um, so the question of, uh, and also how it was called the red love, um, I would say that Alexandra Kontai probably had a, a very, very strong sense of irony in, in uh, her life back then and how she was calling, um, how she was naming her novels. And uh, looking at the situation 100 years later, very often I have the feeling that somehow we never learned enough from uh, our historical mistakes, to say it like that. Like that very often similar patterns of struggle for power um, also within uh, progressive movements keep repeating themselves and they keep repeating in a way that some you really have to ask yourself well but we had this hundred years ago why do we have it again let's you know finish with some problems that we already de deducted that there are problems like the you cannot have like for example I always think you cannot have socialism without freedom and love. And then very often we fall into the trap that we think that we will, you know, reach socialism through different forms of, um, well, mistakes from the past. And yes. then I keep asking myself about that, yeah. Yes, and uh, then we go to the question, is, is uh, the end of capitalism uh, possible without uh, the complete abandoning of patriarchy and uh, the power games that it has with... Uh, that, that comes with it because uh, what you just said, uh, uh, every revolution uh, at the end uh, ends up uh, making the same mistakes and going again to power struggles that we, of course, always in a way uh, tie to, to patriarchy. Uh, and that's also interesting uh, what you were saying about uh, the, you know, heteronormative nuclear family uh, that is uh, like, um, and, and in a way, uh, is it uh, uh, in this emancipatory sense, do we have to abandon also this kind of thinking of, uh, um, of the family structure uh, to make a different system possible? I do not, uh, I do not know if we, we have to, in a way, abandon it. What do you think about that? I also don't know. I, I also wouldn't say anything so, you know, strong, radical statement like we need to abandon nuclear family because I don't think that's necessarily true. I think we need to expand the ways how we want together in a way. But they can, just to say immediately, OK, let's give up a nuclear family. It's I don't know. I, I don't think that's the good way. I somehow even find it very, in a way, you know, childish desire. Um, because also nuclear families offer 
way too much uh, structure uh, uh, in our lives and way too much emotions and they built us in a way how we are now and uh, that um, it's not that um, I would say it's pretty would be pretty irresponsible to just say yeah let's dismantle nuclear family no but I not dismantle it completely but maybe uh just uh, see it in a different way like expand it maybe like because uh in the good old days uh we had a family that was much uh, wider than it is today i think mm -hmm. that uh, this neoliberal capitalism just made you know this this family smaller and now you're expected to have you know the the whole community inside one small household and i think it's really impossible and it's making people frustrated not mm. like to abandon the heteronormative family will it will never happen of course but then it should not happen but maybe to uh, uh, may, uh, may uh, make it possible for these kinds of family structures to also be wider in a sense that you know you have not just relatives but you also have communities friendships neighbors all of these things that we had maybe in socialism you grew up in a in a socialist huge socialist building you you like to talk about and your early childhood um in some interviews i i, I read that you said that uh, uh you of course had very clo close relationship to all of your neighbors and you know you could go and play at another person's house so your family was in a way extended you know that's that's what i'm talking about when i say no, abandonment, the, the, not the, like yeah like in my building uh, nobody was locking their doors like yeah it was just okay you go to the neighbor's place and and it was not only my building that was the like experience of really a lot of people that i know um but what i wanted to say now the, the, yeah but I, I still think somehow it extends from society to society because you really have like you still have families that are pretty big and pretty wide and that hold themselves together and then on various occasions whether if it's some kind of holiday or uh, some important date for, for them, then these connections are preserved. And then people who are very diverse, actually, from, who can belong to one family can get together and talk together. And I think that's the practice that, that has been um, present since ever, somehow. The, like, it's, it's really present. And in some societies, it's very important. But the, um, I guess that uh, this kind of trend that you mentioned, this neoliberal atomization of of um, um, of you, how do you say family structures? Yeah, yeah family, family structures. This kind of atomization of of people and and the family units. Maybe it's it's better world word um, <clears throat> is um, some kind of. Um, yeah, so com complicated societal uh, contemporary trend. And uh, yeah, I also don't like it. I like a lot of people on one spot, drinking, cheering, laughing, fighting, and, uh, you know, having uh, more or less meaningful, meaningful conversations, but having the sense that they are there together. Yes, and... Uh... Mm -hmm. What you were just saying also raises a, a question uh, because that uh, uh, at one side we have uh, all these female characters that are uh, by some kinds of ways of civil uh, disobedience uh, uh, trying to fight for a more just world, a world with more solidarity, a world with more friendship and love. Uh, and at the other side, uh, very often uh, the male heroes in your work uh, are uh, in a way uh, um, personification of, of uh, nationalism, of these really strong male heroes. And then it makes me think of, of uh, what inspired you, of course, because you, you, uh, you in a way uh, talk about these, uh, uh, these issues we deal with here on the Balkans and uh, in Serbia. Um, uh, what is happening uh, from the 90s to today uh, with the right wing movement, but also now uh, when uh, we are in a way after the transition and privatization, while privatization entering to a new, in a new stage, uh, we have a new rehabilitation of uh, war heroes, of this uh, male power of, uh, of the right wing movement. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask you, um, 
uh, what do you think about this? And if you can tell us a little bit uh, from from the aspect of the male characters in your work. Yeah, like when it comes to male characters in my work, it's very simple. Like it, it's literally my decision to you know treat them in the same way as I don't know male authors treat uh, when they have one wom a woman in in their films that, or works. So yeah, they're the function. They're there to represent patriarchy, and they're not important more or less. That's also why probably male actors doesn't like really to don't like to play in them. Um, and uh, yeah, and they're very much embedded in the in the in the, like Serbian society of of nowadays, and they're very much embedded in this society that has been through serious repatriarchalization and um, the, the, this kind of coming back to the traditional values, whatever that means. Um, and it went to, through that process, like also starting with the, the dissolution of Yugoslavia and with the war. Um, no matter how socialist Yugoslavia was patriarchal, what happened after '91 is ten times worse. Like it, it really cannot be compared, and it's some kind of serious backlash that that happened. That was also examined examined in the, the scientific literature until now, and. Um, like the, and also very big aspect of of um, of the war was also very serious war on women like mass rapes that Serbian army and paramilitary units uh, uh, did in Bosnia was uh, their way how to carry uh, that war and uh, it all left uh, serious profound consequences on. Uh, how we perceive gender in in um, also Serbia nowadays, 30, 25 years later, um, and this whole um, so we really witness to this kind of display of power of you know young or less young uh, uh, aggressive uh, uh, manhood uh, on the streets um, in the public space who insist on certain kind of appearance, insist on certain kind of violence and insist on certain kind of hegemonic masculinity, which is, uh, well, not only deeply toxic, but really it turns out to be our main enemy. Because how else can I, what can I say for, you know, groups of young men who are organized, well, practically by the state, but they appear to be self-organized um, in order to, you know, go and attack uh, the, the, some of the first gay prides, go and attack uh, anti-fascist meetings, go and, uh, you know, paint the walls with uh, 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 war criminals that are considered to be heroes. And that's this typic typical terror of hegemonic masculinity in combination with nationalism that I'm really, like, I can't, I can't, I really can't. And seeing from that perspective yeah when i integrate the the main focus if i'm writing it is about um people from the margins and it is about uh, you know rebellious women who decided to you know raise up from some uh, from um, a certain reason and in that kind of script yeah they're really there is uh, the only place that male characters take um, uh, in this kind of script uh, is practically to be only personification of, you know, practically ideology, uh, uh, um, a dominant ideology in the society. And that ideology is nationalist and patriarchal and uh, 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 um, also very much capitalist. Um, and um, yeah, that's... Uh, and it has to be opposed to to what um, characters in the play are fighting for. Yes, and what you just mentioned uh, about uh, uh, the uh, state in a way also influencing these young uh, people, this, these right wing movements that are not uh, not just political but also social movements. Mm -hmm. uh, and recently, what is happening in uh, Serbia is uh, this kind of. Uh, 
um, revival and uh, rehabilitation of uh, war criminals uh, from the past, like uh, Ratko Mladic, uh, um, convicted war criminal that uh, uh, now, uh, after so many years, uh, is uh, getting attention because uh, they are starting to draw like murals of him and the whole capital of, uh, of Serbia, Belgrade, is full of mm. stencils and graffiti. Uh, hero and uh, uh, why do you think this is happening because it's very interesting that our government and our president Vucic is uh, uh, mostly perceived from the west uh, and the western governments as somebody that uh, brought uh, neoliberal values to, to Serbia, which is really funny, you know, because I think uh, uh, that uh, with him, um, in in a way, uh, um, uh, giving the place for uh, for this kind of wild privatization and uh, wild, uh, uh, um, like all these factories that are coming to uh, to our um, you know, country that don't have any kind of regulations, like uh, Serbia becoming this playground also for the West where they can do all their dirty work. And it's interesting that they do not perceive him at all as uh, as what he was. And that was a very uh, right, a right uh, way. He was a part of a, a, a very radical right wing uh, movement uh, during the 90s. Uh, so how, how do you look at this uh, uh, this kind of a way of, uh, of uh, the West uh, uh, perceiving the territory of ex-Yugoslav countries. And why do you think that this uh, right-wing uh, uh, movements are happening uh, uh, today here and also in Europe also? Yeah, like, no, like, but most of the time, the way how West perceives the, the, the our, uh, our space is uh, very, like, insulting in a way. And uh, it's very much clear, especially when it comes to, you know, how our governments were being constructed in the past 30 years that it's not always about, you know, uh, the freedom and democracy, but it's very much about different interests and stuff. I'm pretty much sure that Vucic will lose the elections once when he loses the support of of um, the, the important Western countries. And uh, in the same way as Milosevic also like, was removed from power with the big, big uh, influence on the one hand, with, because of the big satisfaction uh, among uh, Serbian people, but at the same time, because of big, big influence of of uh, Western powers, so to say. Um, and it's very, it's also very somehow hypocritical how all of a sudden in the case of Vucic and him rising to power and also maintaining this power and doing everything that he is doing, um, like completely taking over every aspect of the state, and deep state in, in, in Serbia. Um, and how it was so easy to simply forget, for everybody to forget that only you know 10 years ago, he was the one putting Boulevard of Ratko Mladic signs uh, on the boulevard that was called back then uh, uh, Boulevard Avnoja, that then changed the name to Boulevard Zorana Džinđića. So it was called the Boulevard of Anti-Fascist, uh, uh, um, Anti-fascistic uh, uh, anti uh, 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 alliance of uh, how, how do you translate Avnoid? Like Avnoid that decided to form Yugoslavia in uh, in Yaitse on 29th November, and this kind of anti-fascist uh, uh, um, alliance of uh, uh, of um, um, how do you say people's liberation of yeah. people's uh, people. liberation struggle. And then that name was changed into Boulevard of Zoran Džinđić, of uh, the shop prime minister. And then on that Boulevard, Vučić was putting the signs uh, Boulevard of Ratko Mladić te only 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, why would we be surprised that now he's, uh, and we know that he has all the power in the state, that he's protecting, you know, these people who are going through Belgrade and painting the walls with Ratko Mladic. Like, it's it's the same line that goes also from Vucic's involvement in, uh, the, uh, the, in the war uh, in Bosnia, where he was having uh, um, his famous statements like, yeah, yeah, we will kill 100 Muslims for every dead Serb and stuff. It was all forgotten. It was all completely forgotten. And he has the history of being in power, actually, since the 90s until now. And he has the history of being, you know, having his public appearances that are simply outrageous from the 90s until now. 
but at the same time, he's the final stage of introducing uh, a, a privatization and the, the final stage of post-socialist transformation and the so-called transitional process uh, in uh, in Serbia. And it's the, the process that also started with the dissolution of Yugoslavia. It did not start any time later. It, 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 it's the whole historical trajectory that starts with Milosevic, starts with the dissolution of Yugoslavia, starts with the war, and then has different stages and different outcomes and now we're probably in its final stage and that's the final stage where probably there is nothing else left to sell i mean there are some stuff but mm, probably we won't get there yet but now this is like when it comes to you know uh all the water all the railways all the, the, the maybe it will also be sold i don't know it, it's always possible but now there is no more factories left to be sold and now we can finally become this kind of playground for different, you know, greenfield investments for where the state is subsidizing some foreign investor to come and build a factory out of nothing to pay uh, 300 euros wage, uh, minimal wage to people. And then after five years, when subven uh, subventions, subsidies are off, then they pack their bags, they leave. And we are still left with, um, you know, devastated economy and uh, uh, um, very uh, huge lack of dignity in people's lives. Yes, and also talking uh, what you were talking about, those are uh, the happy scenarios because we have also the scenario of uh, of the Yura uh, South Korean factory where the workers uh, exactly. had to wear diapers. You have a uh, Ling Long uh, factory that is now being built, the Chinese uh, um, tire factory, uh, where they discovered, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of workers from Singapore without papers that they were keeping in clothes and... Uh, from Vietnam, uh, yeah. keeping closed in uh, in some kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, spaces. Like a playground, like the, Serbia is some kind of the playground of of you know contemporary capitalism on European periphery, and it's this. The, the, uh, I started saying like we will, uh, this world will, uh, Europe will not recover from the fall of Berlin Wall for another fifty years. I, I literally mean that, like the, the this kind of ideological damage done with the whole demonization with the defeat of of socialism what socialist idea because the fall of berlin wall was perceived as such and the, the, this big ideological damage that all of a sudden like we need to practically recover the thinking that social justice is fine that it's fine to have you know uh state taking care of education and of the healthcare system that it's fine to you know put the collective effort that it's not about you know desire of one uh preduzetnik of one you know the person who is investing uh that it's not about you know private capital but it's about actually society and it's about public institutions we have to rehabilitate that this is possible and that this is a good idea and what happened with you know as the one of the consequences of this historical defeat of socialism in yugoslavia it was you know it's the most the bloodiest consequence of them all and um, what uh, we got from the whole process at the end is that we have all these you know, the, we have this something that I the, the call this folklore um, right wing, um, um, uh, the, 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 like this kind of folkloristic right wing uh, uh, nationalist uh, ideology that is, um, it's like some kind of atmosphere in the society. It's underlining every uh, social movement that appears. It's underlining um, the, every new politician that appears. It's underlining everybody who gets some kind of power in the uh, uh, in the public arena. Like, for example, now with these ecological protests, um, it's one of very strong, um, that, that brought so many people to the streets. But you have very strong right-wingish appeal to them. You hear very strong thing of, oh, Serbian land, uh, Serbian peasant, uh, our land, our rivers, and so on and so on. But you really have it like, you know, have some violin playing you to, to the ear that it's this kind of, that it's so embedded on polit in political right uh, that I really don't see how, the, the way how to in the in the near in the near future how to get the society out of out of that um, 
ideological background that was really carefully set. And that part of ideological background goes perfectly, perfectly hand in hand with the privatization. And I'm not going to say wild privatization or criminal privatization, because more or less every privatization is, you know, there because of the regulation and somebody's profit and it's criminal in, in itself. Uh, it goes perfectly hand in hand with the whole process of post-socialist transformation, with the privatizations, and with uh, 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 the this kind of um, taking at the at the very end taking the power away uh, from the people uh, and taking in the case of Serbia taking away also the dignity from their lives. Yes, and I think this is very important that you mentioned uh, uh, because uh, we had these huge ecological, uh, ecological protests uh, concerning uh, the uh, Rio Tinto uh, uh, making uh, uh, lithium mines, uh, taking lithium from, from Serbia. And uh, uh, it also had some very problematic uh, laws that were supposed to be uh, um, uh, put into power. Uh, but what you just said, I think, was very important because the two of uh, us also went uh, went to these protests. Uh, and uh, that, that was the thing that uh, we both realized when we were there, uh, that the problem is that all of these anti-globalistic, uh, in a way, good ideas are very closely related, as you said, uh, to the right. Uh, and uh, also with the combination of the demonization of the socialist idea and still after the Cold War being over, we still have this kind of demonizations of, of, of most of the socialist idea uh, in the West, also here. Uh, and um, uh, say, uh, saying that, I would like to um, maybe raise the question of the project that two of uh, us did together in 2016. Uh, when we went together to North Korea and we did a project called Freedom, the most expensive uh, capitalist word. We visited North Korea as Western tourists uh, going there on a touristic tour. Uh, and um, we were there with a lot of Western tourists also. And it was very interesting that when we came there, um, uh, compared to uh, most of our uh, um, friends in the group uh, that uh, were very like shocked with everything they saw there. For us, it was very familiar in a way. Uh, and uh, we uh, we were in a, uh, in a way like we felt at home in a way. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, how uh, can you, uh, this demonization of, of socialist idea that you were talking about, how can we uh, relate it to uh, this, um, uh, the, uh, this thing that happened to us in North Korea and the way that uh, people are uh, looking at North Korea as like the uh, worst uh, mysterious uh, black hole in the world, like being, you but, know, the... But for me, when we went there, uh, I was thinking about it a lot later. And I actually think that part of the whole familiarity with, uh, with uh, uh, what we encountered in, in Pyongyang uh, had much more to do with our, exactly our... Um, history and our you know our memories uh, that uh, relate to you know um, our childhood uh, uh, in the second half of the 80s but also to our childhood during the 90s because uh, what was different between two of us and majority of our group who practically came from you know rich western countries most of them was uh, the while they were seeing uh, this kind of Stalinist black hole all around them, we actually saw a um, very familiar way of propaganda in the combination with something that insanely reminded actually on uh, reminded of some aspects of Serbian society in the 90s, like with the way how the small shops emerged, how you could see actually some private businesses functioning in the gray sphere, how they have the double uh, way to calculate um, uh, the exchange rates. Uh, one is the state rate, one is the black market rate. How is the, like everything, all of that was very much familiar to us and we could see these sub subtle differences or not so subtle, if you ask me, it was very obvious, but it was not obvious for them because the only thing that they expected to see was this big propaganda thing uh, with the posters, with the leaders, with and, and then it was very much in in the line with what they thought that they will get. 
And that at the same time, we simply had the eyes and we had the life experience that could tell us, well, come on, really, you cannot say, you know, the, the, if you call this totalitarian, then it's full of cracks in that totalitarian um, uh, image. And, uh, but it also, like, and then again, like the whole, I always, I also never liked the, the, the notion of totalitarian regimes because it's so easy to, to jeopardize it for for simple, you know, very redundant and reductionist um, uh, way to, I don't know, talk about, um, you know, certain countries or regimes or somehow it, it kills, the it takes the complexity out of the picture. And uh, in order to understand the, the societies and the world better, it really, we should see them as much more complex than usually, I don't know, that propaganda tells us so, or in this case, Western propaganda. And that's also somehow how at the end we made the show because that show was not at all about North Korea. It was more about our position in that whole thing. It's about our position between, you know, some kind of nostalgia for the past, desire for the better future, and also the position in the society as it is now. And uh, how we uh, deal with... Um, how can we play with this notion of tourism, how we can play with serving people what they want to hear in order to extract some kind of gain from them. That was the whole first part of our show, how to serve them, you know, insane amount of actually fake news and post truths. Like before the terms even became popular, we that's actually what we were doing in the show in order to uh, get back, you know, the gain through selling the false souvenirs or, you know, demanding money for adopting uh, the false child and, and stuff like that. But that yes, you were, it, it's interesting you just mentioned the false realities because uh, I think that was one of the, uh, for me, the most interesting things that happened in our tour. And that is that, uh, uh, of course, uh, our friends from the West, uh, they perceive North Korea as some kind of a totalitarian Disneyland on one hand. But on the other hand, they were perceiving the whole country as some kind of a Truman show that was made for them, like them being, yeah. you know, Truman, because uh, it was interesting that we were, uh, we had a situation when uh, there was a festival of uh, Kim Il-sung's birthday called uh, um, the Festival of the Sun, and uh, we were walking on some kind of a mountain, and at one point we saw these old women that were dancing uh, to uh, some popular North Korean songs, uh, and we, of course, danced with them, and it was really fun and afterwards a couple of our friends uh from western europe uh, they they said uh, did you see that they did that because of us and we were like what uh, well did you see that they played the music when we came they were sitting there but when we came they played the music and started dancing and we were like what are you talking about uh, like well it's it's all of that is done because of us and it was very interesting this arrogant position of the western tourist thinking that everything that is happening is happening for his own eyes you know that that was very interesting to me also yeah i mean it's really that kind of arrogance that starts seriously getting on your nerves and you notice it much much easily you easily notice it especially you know when you know you when you come from the country on the periphery and then when you are looking at the way how tourism is developed and how everybody is talking about yeah let's make this friendly place for tourists and then you see tourists acting as everything belongs to them and it becomes really really annoying like in belgrade the way how i don't know the, the, the certain aspects of city life in the city center are being adjusted to the tourists is deeply, deeply annoying. And somehow I actually think that that's the, the, the feeling that most of tourist places, like local people in the tourist places uh, commonly share. The, the, that's this kind of arrogance of, I'm coming there to leave you my money and now you should be at my disposal. Well, sorry, no, <laughs> no, no.
Yeah, and it is a way of contemporary colonialism that has to do, you know, with, with the colonialism that the West is uh, used to. And uh, we were also inspired when we were looking at that uh, movie uh, documentary from 1988. Uh, you remember the cannibal tours. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very great documentary. It's on YouTube. People can see it uh, uh, just uh, right in cannibal tours. Uh, it, it's about uh, these uh, Western um, uh, tourists from Europe and uh, America that uh, went uh, uh, as eco-tourists uh, uh, to Papua Nova, uh, New Guinea uh, and uh, they were uh, actually uh, uh, trying to you know like to see how how uh, the um, the people the indigenous people lived there of course with a great amount of arrogance and uh, you know colonial way of, of behavior uh, but the great thing that happened uh, there is that uh, they uh, that the people there the um, they started joking with the, the western mm -hmm. turns you know they, they started making fun of them uh, there is this great scene when one of them is uh, talking and you see that he is doing that on purpose talking how they eat meat of people you know mm -hmm. and for me it was really great and we had a, a little similar experience we will see now um, a video an excerpt from from our show we had a similar experience with uh, with the North Koreans uh, and I loved that that they were keeping us in some kind of a, they were keeping us also as some kind of wild animals and we uh, very uh, often felt uh, like we were performing also a choreography for them uh, because we had to walk in a uh, in a specific way, we had to behave in a specific way, and it often happened to us um, in these places, like when we went to the Palace of the Sun, where where you have yeah. the remains of of, of the leaders. Uh, we had to behave in a certain way, and we saw like the. Uh, uh, the, the the workers and the the the, the army uh, people of the North Korea uh, looking at us and like you know uh, laughing. laughing at us mm -hmm. yes because we were like this you know performing this choreography for them it's, and I really love exactly. this yeah I love this position uh, and so we uh, I would like uh, for us to see this uh, small excerpt of uh, of this visit to the Palace of the Sun we where we had to perform uh, uh, this kind of rit ritual. Uh, uh, how to uh, bow to uh, to the uh, dead? Uh, the, uh, the, the, just just to add something. That's exactly the point. Like what the, our friends from the group never realized. They were thinking that everything was being around, directed for them, for us. But at the same time, they did not realize that actually we were directed by North Korean guides, by the whole system, how the tourism functions there. We were the ones who were performing. We were the ones who were set up for for uh, for. Uh, we were the ones in the middle of of uh, that direction and, and set up. And that was very funny, actually, to realize how you know uh, you think one thing. That's also the our liminal position um, that that enabled us to somehow you know analyze better and to be aware of that. Yeah. Okay. So let's see this excerpt. Raspospešno se pokrete drake, prišli su na neki oficir. I pitali su nas, jel ste vi iz Jugoslavije? Mi smo rekli da jesmo. Pa ovdje su nam to rekli Jugoslavija, da ćete ovamo. Jugoslavija, this way! Onda su nas uvodili u prostoriju u kojem je dominirao ogroman portret Tita, kako predaje orde i kinu u sobu. A tu su bili drugi pokloni, lovačke puške i preparirani nekodi koji su mi dvojica zajedno uspunili prilikom kini u sobove posete Zagreba. A onda smo nastavili nekim nizom hodnika i oni su rekli a ovo je glavni poklon koji je Tito poklonio Kinu Sungu prilikom njegove posete Koreje. Na sred velike osvetljene prostorije se nalazio dužanstveni, divni, sjajni, crveni jugo. I to je nama naša borba dala Tito, Tito, Tito. Živio na naša Tito, Tito, slobodo. Uh, so, uh, 
can we talk about uh, freedom today uh, with uh, with global surveillance, uh, with the way we live our lives, with the technologies, uh, uh, with uh, parliamentary democracy? Uh, can we talk about a freedom in the Western world that West likes to uh, say that uh, freedom only exists uh, in, you know, democracies? Yeah, depends what you think that freedom is, I guess. And what is freedom for whom? I believe that somebody feels really free with the fact that, you know, has in the smartphone with the click of, uh, with one swipe, uh, the whole, you know, information of this world, like in one, uh, in one uh, gadget. And then at the same time, it can be, you know, the horror, it's the ultimate horror for me or you probably. Um, and um, this kind of like in one moment, like we all started believing that freedom is only about parliamentary democracy and that freedom is only about, you know, how the freedom is usually perceived um, in the in this kind of the world that won the Cold War, to say to say it like that. And then at the same time, we discovered that freedom is not only in um, the way uh, how you dress and how many pairs of uh, different jeans you can own and how many different products you have in the supermarkets, but maybe it's also about, you know, maybe freedom to go to the school, to go to the university. Maybe it's also about, you know, the freedom to go to the doctors whenever you need it and not to, you know, uh, be afraid if you will be in a, if you will be able to pay medical expenses, maybe, you know, the freedom is about um, the possibility of, um, uh, you know, class uh, transgression from generation to generation. Maybe it is about, you know, to leave your work and don't go back to the work, but do something else with, you know, friends and family or by yourself. And that um, many different some we got some forms of freedom and many other forms of freedom we uh, irreversibly lost and uh, for me at least quite a lot of these forms of freedom that that we lost um, uh, will be something that i consider to be the freedom that that is worth fighting for and yeah i don't know what what else to add to that uh and um when we talk about freedom, uh, we cannot um, not mention uh, the unfree uh, lives we have been uh, living uh, the the last. Now it's it's been two years with the pandemic, uh, when the world actually stopped, and when we saw that it is possible for for the, for world, the world to stop, to stop for the world to stop in a way, and uh, also. Uh, our jobs also stopped uh, because you and I are also free freelance workers and uh, used to this kind of precarious work. Uh, and um, what do you think will happen to arts and culture uh, in the future uh, because of the whole situation? And do you think it will uh, uh, disappear or uh, transform? And uh, yes, what what is your your take on the whole issue of, of the pandemic and the post COVID uh, reality that we will be facing? Mm, yeah, well, arts and culture will not disappear, but they will be transformed in a certain way. And the question is how, like, why, what we can notice in um, in our lives, for example, at the moment is um, like this um, ability, like certain aspects of our lives and of what was making, you know, this, this job in a way very appealing um like meeting li live and uh, communicating live and traveling and uh, having that kind of exchange and and experience um is uh, really being reduced to only you know the basic things and in this moment okay pan pandemic is still on and constantly there is some new crisis appearing um and i'm very much afraid that you know this idea i also noticed that some um like um big uh, funding um, open calls that appeared last year were all about uh, you know open calls that should uh, reimagine the future of touring in the performing arts and then like 
come on, we are freelancing in the performing arts. Touring is one of the most important things that we actually do. And if you take away the touring from us, then I mean, what is what will be there? What is there? Um, what will be left? And um, it is also interesting because uh, during this BTEF, uh, where the uh, BTEF festival, it's a huge international mm -hmm. festival in Belgrade, we uh, uh, the team was ecology, and there was a uh, uh, there was a great discussion about uh, uh, like. Uh, again uh some european big european artists that were uh one of those saying that we should not travel on planes uh, we should like you know the Greta Thunberg by thing. train yeah yeah by yeah. train and then the the artists from uh from south america were like yeah it's easy for you in europe to exactly. travel by train but and car but uh, you know uh, exactly call electric cars but what should we do take a boat for i don't know two weeks to come to europe you know yeah 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 so it's is a, a different position again or or as i would as i would comment on the same thing yeah the train is beautiful i completely agree with traveling by train if the politics of european union towards serbia have not destroyed our railway network in one way or the other so i mean how can i travel by train because the train network is really not functioning anymore yeah yeah uh, and um, this raises also the, the question of uh, ecology because we have been uh, uh, thinking about uh, the ecological issues more and more with, uh, with the global climate change crisis. Uh, and uh, I think, of course, it has been here for a while, but now I think that uh, uh, as it uh, being uh, again uh, a thing that is now influencing also the, uh, the richer societies and the more developed societies, they have realized uh, that uh, by uh, them being ecological it will not save the whole world that is uh, going into a global disaster uh, now we have uh, also we had uh, a situation with planes not uh, flying and of course it made a great impact uh, to ecologies of course that, that didn't last for for long and now uh, we have of course we had the whole uh, cop 26 which uh, ended up uh, in raising questions uh, uh, that uh, will at the end uh, not will happen as always uh so uh your uh one of your re most recent plays uh has been uh, dealing uh, it's called the play uh of the end of the world uh and uh, it has been dealing with the uh issue of um, in a way of nature uh your main character um is um uh, trying to uh, save a tree uh, in a symbolic way uh, uh she does not uh, want to let uh, um, uh, the government uh, tear down a tree and she is uh, she is tying herself to the tree and in this kind of dystopia that you imagined uh, she will be convicted uh, to death because of this uh, and then uh, who actually saves her uh, nature saves her the trees uh, uh, in a way uh, uh, they they uh, they become alive and they uh, they go to save uh, this main female character destroying all the things like destroying all the institutions destroying the surveillance cameras mm -hmm. uh so uh do you think that nature can uh in a way uh, teach us uh, uh, uh solidarity and uh, uh can we learn something from nature first i want yeah. to hear from you and then i would want to see an uh excerpt um yeah well she's dead the tree uh, the trees do not save her and but uh, what uh, the, that you know that act of rebellion provokes is that it has been enough and then you have the coalition of you know her mother and the friend and the tree and the other trees and then other people join who will make this kind of coalition to turn over uh, the social relations that are deeply unjust in the moment when the play begins. Um, yeah, nature can teach us a lot. And for example, that play of the end of the world is uh, like, it's very easy. Like, I also call it this eco-feminist play that I have, but practically it is the play about um, impossibility to move on in the world like it is now and it is about this kind of feeling that we are at the end of certain epoch that we are at the end of one era and that something new is starting and nobody knows what the new will be and um, it's also the 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 story about uh, this kind of um, 
trans, uh, trans-human, trans-species solidarity uh, that uh, is the part of the, the, um, the, this coalition between the, 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 how humans and the nature need to re-establish the connection again and how they have to build it up from, from the completely new um, uh, new um, temeli, temeli, new ground. Ground, yeah. yeah. And um, it's also about, uh, it's this story about how actually we can... Um, the, from and it's not uh, uh, by accident that it's about the tree and about the trees and about you know this is one tree in the park but the tree in the park also talks about how trees actually know what the communism is and how these big forest ecosystems function for themselves and how they know how to distribute the resources and how they simply do not care about private property and private ownership and private interest doesn't uh, play any kind of important uh, part in the forest unless when people bring it. So um, it was also somehow my way to think about this ecological approach to to how we see the world somehow also from more leftist perspective not to take it away from uh, um, this um, uh, thing that that i I somehow see with the politics today that the green movements are getting a lot of a lot of uh, support with deep reason with with really really deep reason but at the same time a lot of green agenda is still deeply embedded in the capitalist policies and really do not seek to and we see it really often that there is also a lot of green red coalitions or green movements with some kind of um leftist uh, rhetorics or or values but once when the things really become serious they more and more act on on the liberal scale and um i also think that that kind of approach to to the, the how we think about ecological policies and politics um, will not actually bring us um, any substantial change that the whole thing needs to be completely restructured and not be, to find the solution within the system who created that created the problem problem in the first place yes i completely agree and uh, i would like uh, us to see uh, an excerpt uh, from a, a great uh, uh, movie by uh, uh, Yelena Maksimovic called Homelands, and uh, you wrote uh, a monologue for uh, the end of this uh, movie. Maybe you can tell us just in one sentence what the movie is about, and then we can see the excerpt. Yes, Yelena Maksimovic approached me when she was uh, working on that movie. Um, it is actually the movie about uh, her heritage, and it's a movie about um, uh, the heritage of her grandmother, who belonged to the family of Greek partisans, who had to flee uh, the Greece um, in '47, uh, and uh, they came to Yugoslavia, who accepted the Greek um, uh, communist refu- refugees back then, and in a way. Um, this woman uh, uh, was fighting against uh, injustice and patriarchy in her own country and then came to Yugoslavia and ended up in some kind of socialist patriarchy. And, um, but at the same time, she was uh, teaching her granddaughter uh, all these revolutionary songs. She was uh, telling her about her past, uh, her, uh, in her youth. She was telling her, uh, practically, she was learning her how to think about social justice and about better world. And in one moment, um, Yelena Maksimovic decided to go back to this village that uh, her mo- uh, grandmother ca- came from. And uh, what she found there was on the one hand, the ski resort, and then on the other hand, the ruins of, of the houses of uh, people who were uh, communist affiliated and that all uh, were killed or um, uh, uh, expelled or uh, had to had to flee. Um, so this movie is about relationship between, you know, in a way, ancestors and uh, nature and uh, the village and uh, uh, and uh, the author of the film. And the final somehow outcome when when uh, Yelena asked me to to write this uh, final monologue for, for this final monologic sequence, it was supposed to somehow. Uh, um, 
get together all these different aspects, but also to think about what is beyond, how to uh, go more, how to imagine the new rebellions, how to think about that in a way. And that's how this uh, um, this monologue actually was uh, was made, how uh, um, why it was uh, written and um, how it was developed. Let's see it. Naš sveći se toliko zagreti da će za uvijek biti lepto. Ono koje prži i ono koje ubije. Zamišljam tako kako naš svet nestaje. Morala bih da kažem polako, ali zapravo ne. I tako mi se čini da još malo. I svi ćemo nestati u vatri sunca. Sad ove vetar koji najavljaju jesem blago miše travu. One izvire iz zidova, temenja dvorišta jedne kuće. Okolo je neko drvo i odvija se tajni život biljaka. Ovdje je nekada živjela jedna žena koja je meni postala najvažnija na svetu. Ruševine. Tu su bili ljudi. Tu je bio rad. Neko je ubijen. Neko je pobegao. Ljudi su otišli. A kuće su se urušile od tuge. Ruševine su spomenici koje pravi priroda. Nasledđe komunistima koji su nekada živjeli ovde. Nekada mislim da je rat protiv prirode u neku ruku i obraća sa komunizmom. Drveć je zapravo živi komunizam. On upoznaje ravnopravnu distribuciju resursa i dobara preko svog korenja. Ono zna da će zajedno kao šuma živjeti i rasti ako je svima dobro, a ne ako se jedan bez grana tako da poguši ostalo. Drveći šume znaju da resursi moraju da se pase i pravedno delu. Znaju šta je uzbuđenje i lepota, ali i savržen mir. Um... I, uh, I like to say that uh, you inspired me um, well being your friend and working with you you uh, inspired me to become less of a pessimist than I was and less of a, a person uh, imagining dystopia all the time uh, and um, uh, in your work and uh, in your way of dealing with the world you like to um, imagine a better world and uh, like starting from your early works uh, to your later works, you can see this shift from uh, sad endings and catastrophic endings to somehow happy endings or some kind of a, a storytelling that imagines better worlds. Uh, in um, one of your last plays called uh, I Often Dream of a Revolution, uh, you uh, imagine a radical social and political revolution of course led by women free women uh so what would this uh revolution be you said in uh you also say in in the text uh, that you cannot imagine a revolution without blood do you still imagine this kind of a bloody revolution or do you think we can um invent a world uh, where uh, the revolution doesn't have to look like the revolutions in the past yeah, that's um, that's very actually one of the crucial points in 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 that play of, and that's the that's also the moment that somehow also explains that whole I don't know splitting between uh, what is happening in the play and what is happening at the end, and um, a lot of these works, a lot of these plays are pretty much catastrophic in the sense of what is happening in them. But then the play, at the end of the play is reimagined, like somehow all of a sudden it becomes happy end. 
And that's something that I call the political happy ending that I deeply insist on because if the scripts that we produce somehow um, take um, part in um, how we um, imagine the world and how we imagine the relations, uh, social relations in the world and what is allowed and what is not, what is possible and what is not, I want to insist on the fact that happy endings are possible. And um, then we come to the question of revolution and the way how I imagine the revolution. And of course, that I imagine it, you know, brought out by women and uh, brought out in blood. And then that play, uh, I often dream of a revolution, is really the play about um, limitations of political imagination. It is about limitations of my political imagination. And uh, if uh, they... Um, could be if somehow I can overcome them or if how on the wider scale, how we can overcome the, the limitations um, of how we invent and uh, imagine tomorrow. And uh, that's exactly that kind of ambivalence between my impossibility to imagine the revolution that does not happen in blood and my desire that um, it still happens in a, in a different way. And uh, the way how it is maybe easier for me than, than for some other people, and it's easier for me because, you know, or you, we are writing, we can put whatever we want on the paper, um, is that I can articulate these ambiguities and the desires um, in a structured way through, through the written, uh, written word. And um, somehow every step that I take in that direction maybe brings me closer to actually expanding these limits um, of imagination that are brought uh, on to us by uh, the world we live in, in, in the widest sense of, of that word. Um, and um, I deeply, deeply believe that the if there is a, a hope and if there is a rescue for um, uh, uh, for this world and for us, it will uh, come through, it will first appear in our imagination and uh, through expansion of that political horizon and then through love and then through political action and then maybe there is hope. Thank you, Olga, very much. And thank you for ending with this. Uh, thank you for being uh, our guest uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, I would end uh, by uh, wishing you a happy new uh, 2022, uh, hoping that uh, we can uh, maybe not uh, have a revolution in the next year, but maybe try to imagine it. Uh, thank you all and thank you, Olga. And thank you and Happy New Year to you and to all the listeners. And um, yeah, Happy New Year. Happy New Year.